It's the sound of ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Good morning, and thanks for joining us today. It is now less than three weeks until Election Day. While most of the media attention is focused on the presidential election between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump, as it, it's a very close race and most pundits expect the race will come down to just a couple of swing votes and be decided by a narrow margin. But Ohio is not one of those swing states. The former president carried Ohio easily in both 2016 and 2020 and is predicted to do so again. Further down the ballot, though, there are races that could sh shift the balance of power in both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate race between incumbent Sherrod Brown and Republican challenger Bernie Marino, as well as the Ohio 13th Congressional District race between incumbent Amelia Sykes and Republican challenger Kevin Coughlin, are being watched nationally. Both races are airing ads nearly nonstop in a bid to win over voters. Voters in Ohio will also weigh in on state house races with all 99 Ohio House districts up for election and about a third of the state Senate. Voters will also decide on state issue one, which seeks to change how Ohio's political maps are drawn. And Cleveland and Akron led the district seeking levings, levies from voters. We've asked our Ideastream Public Media and State House News Bureau colleagues onto the show today to talk about some of the candidates, issues, and levies on the ballot this November. So let's begin our hour with State House News Bureau Chief Karen Kassler. Karen, welcome to the Sound of Ideas. Hey, great to be here. Great to have you. And if you'd like to join the conversation, do you have a question for Karen? Give us a call. 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Karen, let's start with the U.S. Senate race between incumbent Sherrod Brown and Republican Bernie Marino. The race being watched nationally and is racking up spending. So paint a picture for us. Well, this is going to be the most, and may already be, I think it is, the most expensive U.S. Senate race in Ohio history. Wow. I mean, right now, as of Friday, there's been, and this is just anti-ads, uh, ads against Sherrod Brown, about $104 million of ads against Sherrod Brown, wow. about $78 million of ads against Bernie Marino. Very much smaller numbers when it comes to pro-Brown and pro-Marino ads. So if you're tired of negative ads, well, guess what? There's a couple more. More, a couple more days that you're going to have to put up with that because this race is trending, has, has been trending all along toward negative advertising. So this is a very expensive race. It's considered one of a handful that really kind of de decides the future of the U.S. Senate. Um, the race in Montana is another one. Uh, this is one of the races that Democrats feel that they can hang on to their incumbent and Republicans feel they can pick off that incumbent. Yeah, I, I've got to say, I've personally, and I know uh, some of our producing staff also has seen a lot of ads when you turn on Hulu or uh, watching whatever on TV, you can you can feel the uh, ad space uh, being bought up there uh, in droves. Let me ask you a question, Karen. Do you have a sense? Is there any polling or indication of which way the race is leaning? Well, I don't like to look at polls for the most part just because they are a snapshot in time and they, sure. they don't necessarily give you a, a well, they're, they're not something I would definitely bet on. But I will tell you that the most reliable recent polls have shown Brown in the lead, but not by much. I mean, we're talking about margin of error lead. So very, very tight race between Brown and Marino, which was expected because it's almost certain that Donald Trump is going to win Ohio. And the thought was that he would bring Bernie Marino with him. But Sherrod Brown has had the ability to catch these ticket splitters in previous races. For instance, he ran in 2018 and won when Republicans swept the table when it comes to the statewide executive offices. So there's certainly a hope on his side that he would be able to do that again. And you're seeing his campaigning really not focusing on his Democratic ties, but on his bipartisanship, his ability to work with people of the other party. He says in ads and in flyers that he will work with whoever is in power and he has gone against the president of his own party. Marino's side will say, well, he may say that, but he has voted with Democrats nearly all of the time. And, and Sherrod Brown says he doesn't deliberately downplay his Democratic ties. But in this race, it sure looks like he is pushing his bipartisanship to try to reach those more moderate Ohio voters. Yeah, and let me ask you about Marino's 
endorsement from Trump in the primary. Do you think this race is a test of Trump's influence? Do you see the former president making any moves in the last? I mean, he's got his own election to worry about. But at the same time, um, you know, he's got influence in Ohio, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty fair to say that it was the Trump endorsement that really vaulted Bernie Marino to the win in the primary. Uh, You had three people in the primary. You had Republican Secretary of State Sherrod Brown and State Senator Matt Dolan running against Marino. Dolan was very unlikely to get the Trump endorsement for a variety of reasons, but certainly LaRose and Marino were both chasing it. When Marino got it, it pretty much sealed the deal for him to win the Republican endorsement back uh, during the primary. Now, here we are. moving forward, Marino is really campaigning heavily on Trump's endorsement. I think the bus that he was touring the state with had both his picture and Trump's picture on it. And it says very clearly Trump endorsed on virtually all of his signage. So he's definitely promoting his ties to Trump because, again, Trump won Ohio is expected to win Ohio and won Ohio in 2016 and 2018 or 2016 and 2020 by eight points. So Marino is certainly trying to reach those Trump voters. It's unlikely that Trump's going to come to Ohio for Bernie Marino because the race looks um, Trump's race looks pretty uh, focused on these swing states. Right. But um, there's a possibility Trump has said a couple of times that he may come to Springfield. And that's a whole other issue when it comes to the uh, legal Haitian immigrants that are there. But uh, that's probably the only possible place where Trump might come to uh, support Marino in this race. And and what about candidates looking or excuse me, voters looking for the substance of what these candidates are talking about on various issues? Any debate in sight, any, you know, possibility of town halls or forums where they can hear from these candidates? No, it doesn't look like we're going to get any debates, which is really disappointing. I'm, I've always, I've, I've done many debates, I've participated in many debates, and I, I really think debates are the best opportunity to see the candidates face to face, unscripted, answering questions. Uh, under pressure, I really feel like it's a great opportunity to see the candidates as they are. But we don't appear to have gotten the opportunity to do that. Um, both candidates say they're up for it, and yet somehow it's it's not coming together. Uh, the best way, of course, to look at what the candidates are saying is to get information from a variety of sources, read what's being written about the candidates and what they're saying in their own words in a very in in many different locations i mean the candidates have done individual interviews um i've said i've talked to both of them my colleagues have talked to both of them um in fact my colleagues are going to go out and do a a quick day on the road with them if at all possible Mm. so that's that's a that's a way to 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 do it but it's really we're not going to get that that locally (laughs) one time one stop shop kind of that a debate brings you where you can really hear about all the issues from the candidates in their own words. And do you think there's strategy to that? To candidates well, deciding, hey, I, I, I'm not going to do a debate? Oh, absolutely. I mean, th- there's the question of does who would benefit from a debate. The, the candidate who's leading tends to feel like they don't benefit from a debate. The candidate who's behind tends to feel like they do. But this race is so close that perhaps both candidates feel like they're behind or both candidates feel like they're not going to benefit in any way. But there is a risk, of course, with debating. And we've seen it just with the presidential and vice presidential debates where you have candidates, if they have a bad night, it can really affect the way things go for the rest of the campaign. And so it's a calculated risk. But I have thought all along that it's one of those things that's really worth taking because it does a tremendous service to voters when a debate is well structured and it really focuses on policy and doesn't give the candidates just a a floor to bash each other. Again, this conversation is about you, the listeners, and the voters. So give us a call and tell us what you think, 866-578-0903. You can email us your thoughts at soi at ideasroom.org. You can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Susan wrote in saying the ad about abortion may push some women to vote for Brown. As a 73-year-old, I was offended by that ad. But many of the ads from Marino are false. So that's from Susan this morning. Karen, let's talk about state issue one. Uh, it's, it's a confusing one. Um, first let's talk about how proponents say this measure would change how we draw political maps. Well, what the measure will do, and, and again, it is a, it's a 26 page amendment. It's complicated. And when you go to vote on it, there's a three page summary that tries to 
explain what the amendment would do. Of course, that language was approved by Republicans who are opposed to issue one. So that's something to keep in mind when you read that ballot language. But issue one would create, it would replace the existing seven member Ohio redistricting commission, which is made up of elected officials and replace it with a 15 member citizens redistricting commission made up of three Republicans, three Democrats and three independent voters. And those people would be selected by a panel of retired judges. Those judges would be selected by the Ohio ballot board. So there's a whole process laid out in this amendment of exactly how all this would come together. And the, the Citizens Redistricting Commission would then use the results of the last six statewide elections to come up with a proportionality formula. And then they would draw the legislative and congressional maps based on that proportionality. I mean, for instance, right now, when you look at the last two statewide elections, because the third, which would be this year's, we don't have the results of that one yet. If you look at uh, 2020 and 2022, you'd have about a 57% Republican, 43% Democrat split. Hmm. Um, So that's the kind of proportionality formula that the commission would be guided by. And Republicans have said that this is a Democratic power grab. Democrats, who are largely supportive of this, have said, no, 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 this is an attempt to try to represent how voters actually are voting through their legislative and congressional maps because the current maps don't do that. Karen Michael uh, in Akron just wrote in asking, does issue one create a board that is not directly accountable to the voters? So how does that work as far as any sort of accountability uh, to the constituents? Well, I sat down with former Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor, the Republican who joined the court, the Supreme Court's three Democrats in ruling all seven, ruling seven times that maps from the Ohio Redistricting Commission were unconstitutional in 2021 and 2022. She's the author of this amendment. And she says the accountability is there, that it says right there in the Constitution that members of the commission can remove other members of the commission if they're not doing their jobs. Mm. So there is accountability there, uh, and it's it's written into the actual amendment. So that's where, I, I know the question, of course, has been, well, you can't elect the officials who were then put on the Ohio Redistricting Commission, as you can now, because right now the Redistricting Commission is the governor, the auditor, the secretary of state, and four state lawmakers. But Maureen O'Connor says this commission really relies on each worker on the commission, each commission member to, to do the work or else their fellow commissioners will throw them out. Okay, let's let's you you talked about Republicans saying this is a Democratic power grab. Any anything beyond that as far as stated opposition to uh, issue one? I know that we've reported on some former black lawmakers who stood against issue one. Um, So what are some of the 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 arguments against? Well, I should note that the former lawmakers, the black former lawmakers who are standing against issue one, there, there are there's one current lawmaker, um, okay. uh, Michelle Reynolds, who's also joining them. But um, that's these are mostly Republicans or people who've had problems with the Democratic Party. Um, the Legislative Black Caucus, which is most it's all Democrats in the state house, has supported issue one. And uh, there's a concern about how the districts would be drawn and whether that would potentially cost some black leadership. And that's something that the folks in Michigan, where a similar amendment has been in use, have said is a concern. That's certainly something that's been out there. Uh, But the, the opposition has been strongly coordinated by Republicans and led by Senate President Matt Huffman and Governor Mike DeWine, who have said that this, the, 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 maybe the current system isn't working the way that people were hoping it would, but that this system that is proposed by issue one would not work. Um, DeWine has talked about if voters reject issue one, then he will work with the legislature to come up with an Iowa style commission, an Iowa style proposal, which has gotten uh, a claim across the country as being hmm. one of the more fair ways to do this. But it's important to keep in mind that DeWine is not the legislature. He can only work with the legislature, so he can't necessarily promise that something like that would happen. He can only promise that he would work toward that. Uh, Republicans have launched a bus tour that just finished up around the state uh, promoting a no on one vote. And the, it's the real the opposition 
like last year's issue one, is really broken down on party lines where you have Republicans mostly opposing issue one, Democrats mostly supporting it. Right, right. And I know that, uh, you know, we've had uh, supporters on who have said that as the lines are drawn now, you have this uh, Republican supermajority that uh, keeps pushing bills that aren't in line with kind of the political spectrum of Ohio. Um, and, yeah, that's and that's that's a, a a real issue in that if you don't have competitive districts, then whoever wins the primary is the one who will most likely be elected, and that's kind of what we're seeing right. in, in most of these districts. When I ask O'Connor about that breakdown, the fifty-seven percent Republican, forty-three percent Democrat, she said she doesn't care how the numbers fall. She just wants them to be more proportional and really reflect the last uh, six years of elections, of statewide elections. And now I'm talking to a supporter of the no on one side for our TV show, The State of Ohio, this week to kind of uh, counterbalance some of what O'Connor said. But there are some arguments on both sides that, again, are really split along party lines. All right, let's go ahead and take a call from Tom in West Park. Can we push that call through? Tom, good morning. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I'm a senior citizen, and I vote by mail all the time. I already voted. The issue, uh, On the paper ballot, issue one is very confusing, not just because of the verbiage, because of the wording, but it starts out, you know, almost a whole page in English telling you about English, about issue one, then it jumps to Spanish, and then it continues on to another sheet on another page, another piece of paper, and then after the Spanish is done, you have, are you for or against this, or I I don't remember the exact wording, but it's like, are you for the amendment, yes or no, but there's nothing near that yes or no that says you're putting yes or no for issue one or for the anything, so you're like, it's very confusing, and if you don't know Spanish, I found it just very, very confusing. (laughs) Okay, Tom, that's a that's a great point. And, uh, you know, Tom, someone who actually has uh, uh, experience now with voting for this election. Uh, Karen, what would you just say to the confusion of, of the ballot language when it comes to issue one? Maybe well, not necessarily with which language it's in, but even uh, the substance of what's written has been confusing. And, and I think that there are certainly supporters of issue one who would say that all that is by design that uh, this three-page ballot summary is much longer than any ballot summary we've seen in recent memory, and that Republicans put it in the, uh, in, on the ballot that way to confuse voters. And because typically, if voters are confused, they either don't vote or they vote no, because no preserves the status quo. So I, I, the, the, the language, the supporters of issue one took the language to the Ohio Supreme Court, which then, which is the Republicans on the court then sent it back saying most of it's okay. They ordered a couple of little tweaks, but it is, it it does appear to really suggest that the no on vote side is the side that is the one that the language kind of uh, tips toward. And so I, I think that there is a little bit of confusion there when it comes to how far down the ballot it is, how much verbiage you've got to go through till you get to the actual vote. So it's it's something to keep in mind if you haven't voted yet or if you're going to vote in person. It's uh, I understand when you go through the the machine, you actually have to press through the like three pages of language before you get to the vote part so it can be it can be confusing all right let we we're running out of time but i really want to ask one question about the three ohio supreme court races this november my understanding is that uh, they'll carry party affiliations by the candidate's name it's a change and how do you think that potentially impacts the outcome Well, this is the second time that candidates for the Ohio Supreme Court have had party designations after their name. And I think this year it's incredibly significant because the Ohio Supreme Court races are right after the presidential race on the ballot. So if you're going or you know people who are going to vote only for the presidential race, they may just go down the ticket and vote straight party line, whichever. And having those Supreme Court races so close to the presidential race, which will be the marquee race that everybody practically will be voting on, that's a big deal. Uh, It's only Supreme Court races and appellate court races that have those party designation. Local judges do not have party designation. And I think that's worth noting, too.
Helen wrote in saying, it's disturbing that all three Republican candidates for Ohio Supreme Court have not debated, given interviews, etc. It concerns me because the Supreme Court interprets the intent of the constitutional amendments, such as reproductive rights and potentially passing the anti-gerrymandering issue this term. The current court allowed illegal maps in the past. This lack of transparency from the Republican candidates should give voters pause. Helen, thanks for writing in. Uh, I do want to note that the Ohio Debate Commission will be holding a debate with some of the Ohio Supreme Court justice candidates in a forum at the end of this month in partnership with us, IdeaStream. So that's something that you'll want to catch. Uh, Last, I will, I will be oh. moderating a uh, an, an event, and I think it's the same one at the City Club of Cleveland um, next week with the three Democratic candidates who have all agreed to be at the event. I think they're still maybe trying to get the Republican candidates to agree. I've talked to all six of the candidates, and I'm going to be putting up a story on our website, statenews.org, and putting it out for uh, idea stream to use very shortly about all three of the or all six of the candidates, all three of the races, and and who they all are. I love. Karen, that I casually mention one aspect and you're like, of course, I'm, I'm moderating a, <laughs> a forum too and have a whole article coming out with every one of the justices interviewed. That's great. So, uh, Karen, just quickly, uh, what's on your deck um, as the next three weeks approach, aside from moderating uh, Supreme Court justice forums? A, a lot of conversations like this, because I think that people are, are really interested in this race. I mean, you've got a lot of things on this ballot. President, U.S. Senate, Supreme Court races, the entire Ohio House, half the Ohio Senate, uh, all 15 members of Congress, issue one, a lot of local issues as well. This is a very busy ballot and a lot of people are, are really interested in, in getting out there. And already we've had uh, over a million absentee ballots sent out and hundreds of thousands of people have already cast their ballots. And remember, we here at The Sound of Ideas are giving out information regarding Issue 1. We're going to have the next community store to uh, community tour stop on October 28th. That's a Monday at Oberlin College at 6 p.m. We're going to have a panel talking about Issue 1 and gerrymandering. The event is free. It's open to the public. You can learn more and register for the event at ideastream.org slash soundofideas. And Car I will be there. That's right, that. and Karen will be on the <laughs> Karen, where are you not over the next three years? <laughs> I, I'm happy to be there. That will be a really good one. That'll be great, and I'm, I'm very appreciative that you're going to be joining us for that. Karen Kassler, always a pleasure. We'll, great to talk to you. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to talk about some of the local issues, including these levies being asked for by Akron schools and Cleveland schools. We're also going to talk about the arts tax uh, being proposed at Cuyahoga County and what voters are being asked for. I'm Jenny Hamill. This is The Sound of Ideas. We'll be right back. You're with the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for staying with us this hour. We are spending our hour today talking about some of the important races and issues that voters are going to decide on the November ballot less than three weeks before the general election on November 5th. If you're just joining us, we spent the first part of the show talking over some of the statewide issues voters will see on their ballots, including the race for U.S. Senator, State Issue 1, those Ohio Supreme Court races, now we're going to turn our attention to more localized issues, including school levies and a possible tax increase in the cigarette tax that's used to fund the arts in Cuyahoga County. Joining me now in studio, we have Connor Morris. He covers education for Ideastream Public Media. Connor, thanks for coming in. Hey, glad to be here. We also have Kabir Bhatia. He is senior reporter covering arts and culture. Kabir, hi to you. Hi, thanks for having me. And quick plug. I wanted to join the uh, I wanted to join the plug fest with Karen. The the <laughs> promo we just heard for the Hudson Library, October twenty first. I'll be moderating that, so people can come out and they can complain about my ap appearance today, and then they can enjoy the program. <laughs> <laughs> you are also ubiquitous, you like go. Karen, everywhere at all times. Something like that. Well, if you'd like to join the conversation, do you have a question about these school levies that are being proposed? Give us a call eight six six five seven eight zero nine zero three. You can email us at soi at ideastream dot org. Or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Connor, I'm going to spend some time with you talking about these levies. Uh, we have had listeners email in saying, I need more info. So let's first talk about Cleveland. 
The Cleveland Metropolitan School District is seeking a new levy this election. It appears as issue 49. Tell us what that encompasses, issue 49. Sure, yeah. So it's a joint request. Uh, the largest part is an operating levy to fund uh, district expenses. The second part is a renewal of a bond issue that's expiring. So bond issues, typically those fund construction and capital expenses. So uh, the bond issue, you know, that's not going to be an increase in tax. The operating levy will, though. Um, and this comes at a time when the district just cut expenses earlier this year. Uh, it was mostly a lot of pandemic relief funded programs, but also some administrative staff as well. So that was stuff like uh, summer programming, um, some after school programs as well. Uh, and they do say, uh, the CEO has recently said that a lot more cuts could be coming if the levy fails. And we do have some numbers when it comes to how much money the levy will raise and what type of impact the property owners could see. So kind of uh, spell yeah. that out for us. Yeah, so uh, the operating levy, it's going to be for a period of 10 years. Uh, that's going to, again, represent a new tax. That's going to be like $310 uh, per year for the, the owner of a home valued at a $100,000. Actually, it'll be just about at 300 actually, excuse me. Uh, and that's not including the renewal of the bond issue, which is 2.65 mils. But again, that's not a new tax. It's just renewing something that folks are already paying for, if that makes sense. Well, let me ask you this. The district has a new CEO, Warren Morgan. I wonder how does he and his role factor into this and 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 what are you uh measuring as far as support for the yeah. levy going through yeah he's kind of had a tough job i mean to be to be frank uh he came in and almost immediately kind of was faced with the prospect of having to cut costs yeah. um he's kind of faced some criticism for how he approached that the cleveland teachers union has said you know he kind of raised unnecessary panic about the budget cuts. Uh, he said, uh, the, the, uh, Sherry Brensky, the president, said, you know, we would have had to cut these pandemic relief funded programs sure. anyway. Um, on the positive side, though, the district just got some big news uh, for the first time ever. They're, they can say that they're meeting state standards. They got three stars oh, out of wow. five Excellent. on the state report card. Um, there's a lot of calculation that goes into that, but essentially they were at 2.5 stars before now. They're at three, which is the, the, you know, the, the kind of threshold for meeting state standards overall. Uh, generally speaking, though, I mean, passing the levy, it's a, a big test for Morgan. This is his second year in office. Um, he's pretty consistently said he wants to improve CMST's quality of education across the board. He said, you know, there's not really equity across the district. If you pick one school at random, uh, might have a lot lower scores, test scores than another school. Could be a lot more programming. Some folks are concerned about equity between the east and the west side of the school of, or of the school district, you know, in terms of equity of, of programming and uh, quality facilities as well. There's a lot of facilities that haven't been upgraded as well. Uh, the district has done a lot over the years. But so there's this kind of big, complicated picture that he had to step into. And, um, you know, another angle that we're going to look at, you know, soon is the district could be looking at, you know, uh, its building footprint overall. Uh, uh, the kind of the story that's coming for a lot of school districts is uh, should they be closing some buildings? Uh, the district has like 91 buildings, and we'll be doing some reporting on that soon, actually, on should they, they keep operating 90 buildings or, or not. All right, let's turn to Akron Public Schools before we get to uh, Kabir and his reporting. They're also asking uh, for support from voters uh, in the form of a levy and a bond. Yeah. So both of them are new taxes. Um, but yeah, it is an operating levy and a bond issue. Uh, the bond issue would fund a new North High School. Teachers say that there's uh, just leaking roofs, uh, just also uh, boilers not working, you know, heating and cooling just really not working. And um, it's actually one of the most overcrowded buildings in the district. There's a lot of immigrants and refugees have come to that part of Akron in recent years. But that's kind of a small part of the levy. Um, the bigger ask is, uh, again, operating funds. The district made a lot more cuts than, than Cleveland in terms of like staff cuts. They cut like 285 positions this year, including dozens of teachers. Uh, and so that is... Uh, kind of the context there is both of these districts are saying, you know, we're making cuts, we're trying to be financially responsible, we're going to need new money regardless because of the way that the state's funding system works for schools. And uh, even with both of these levies passing, if they pass this November, both districts are likely going to need to make more cuts to kind mm. of right size the districts, as we were talking about earlier. And I've got to say, I, uh, Connor, I read your piece about North High School yeah. and what they're dealing with as far as frigid rooms when it's cold and, yeah. and, and, and water features because there's <laughs> ceilings yeah. that are leaking and it hasn't been fixed in, in essentially forever. Yeah. Uh, and you really kind of feel for 
the teachers and the students. Of course, it's not a conducive learning environment is what the, the folks are saying there. Okay, let's talk about their new superintendent, Dr. Michael Robinson, because there's also been kind of some controversy surrounding him. And, and how do you think that impacts the levy? Yeah, I mean, just like Dr. Morgan over in, in, in CMSD, he's kind of come at a difficult time having to make cuts. Uh, he's weathered some other controversies of late, though. Uh, there was a board member, school board member, who accused him of bullying her mm-hmm. recently in like a, an email that was obtained by some news outlets. Um, the board kind of in response passed a, a resolution just recently that was saying, hey, we think he's doing a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, as well, uh, he there was a, a rollout of an all-day kindergarten pre uh, pre kindergarten program uh, that uh, was also kind of marred by controversy. A lot of teachers saying we rolled this out too fast and we just need more support. There were allegations that kids were going for hours without having their diapers changed, oh. and so it was a really tough kind of news story for the the superintendent to kind of weather there. Um, but yeah, again, they're both kind of coming in at this, this very interesting, tough time for, for public education and and the country in general. All right. And just quickly, do you have a sense of if, if there is support for this levy and bond issue? Yes. Uh, there, there's a a levy campaign in both Akron and Cleveland. They've been having folks write in with op-eds and things of that nature, folks who are elected officials and the like. In Cleveland, the mayor and the teachers union have been campaigning, uh, doing canvassing and things like that. Uh, there are folks that are are worried about paying more in taxes, though. Um, and uh, there have been, you know, we did a poll recently that showed that a lot of folks are concerned about the cost of living. And that could cause headwinds for folks in terms of getting levies passed this year. All right. Kabir, let's spend some time with you. You have been reporting heavily on issue 55. Mm -hmm. So that's the proposal to increase the cigarette tax in Cuyahoga County. Tell us specifically what the ask is. So the ask is the current tax is 30 cents per pack. It's actually based on per cigarette itself, but per pack, it works out to 30 cents. The ask is to increase that up to 70 cents. So adding 40 cents to the pack of each pack of cigarettes, essentially. Which, I guess if you're a smoker, it Mm -hmm. sounds like a lot. Yeah, sure. What's the feedback you're getting from the public? So the feedback, actually, first of all, when I went and investigated this, because I've never bought a pack of cigarettes, but it turns out that cigarettes are now up to $9, $10 a pack. Which, wow. I I asked him, I said, the clerk, I said, uh, that's the price per cart. And he says, no, no, that's per pack. So then I spoke to some customers, and at least the ones in the shop when I went to, they had no idea. And a lot of them were not there for cigarettes. The clerk even said cigarettes seem to sell primarily to people who have come in because they have run out of their own rolling papers for their own cigarettes, to make their own cigarettes. Got it. Um, And there's other products they sell, of course, that seem to be more popular, which are not part of this. Vapes are not part. Cigars are not part. None of that. Just cigarettes. So this increase to the cigarette tax, um, we won't even talk about the health aspect of it Mm -hmm. yet, Mm -hmm. but... uh, How would this money be used? So the money goes, it's been going since 2007, to um, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, which is the CAC, we call it. Uh, It was formed to, it gets all the money from the cigarette tax, and then it redistributes it uh, through grants to various entities, uh, nonprofits throughout the county, not just Cleveland. I mean, the headlines are always grabbed by uh, uh, Cleveland Orchestra or the museums, but it goes all throughout uh, the county. You know, Shaker, um, the Coventry Peace Campus uh, over in uh, Cleveland Heights, all of these places, the money goes from CAC to them. Okay, let me ask you this. We got an email from Pat, so I'll ask you the question after I read it. Pat says, remember that issue 55 is good for health since teens are less likely to start smoking um, as gas prices rise. So she's referring to inflation. Since people who start smoking as teens have more difficulty quitting, this is especially important. Obviously, that's something that comes up when you talk about vaping sure. and uh, the youth. So let me ask you this. Is there an optics issue at all about the cigarette tax increase and it falling on the shoulders of smokers? Well, smokers certainly, um, I think, what is it, 35% in Cleveland, one of the highest smoking rates in the country. Again, that's just Cleveland. Countywide, it's much less, and it's been slowly uh, declining. Uh, but primarily those smokers, especially in Cleveland, are people of color people who may be uh, somewhat lower income, and the argument has been uh, they're funding this, and yet the programming that CAC funds, the entities that CAC funds, are not uh, serving those communities. Um, when you ask CAC about it, of course, and if you do, if you look at the list of grantees, definitely they uh, um, do seem to be serving a lot of the county, and I should point out at this point, we have to make sure, 
idea stream we do we're one of the entities that receives money from what is now called the cigarette tax that goes through cac also the campaign for issue 55 idea stream did give uh funds towards that campaign support towards that campaign that was not me personally of course i just want to clarify that my reporting is separate but uh those two things are out there we are one of the entities that's uh somewhat involved and i would like to think that we serve everybody in northeast ohio so let me ask you this, uh, based on uh, Pat's email and what we were just talking about regarding health and cigarettes, the World Health Organization says that raising the cost of cigarettes through taxes, quote, is the single most effective and cost-effective measure for reducing tobacco use. I think we all know what the science is when it comes to cigarettes and, and lung and heart health. So is there a rationale or a reasoning that you think people have when it comes to, hey, why not put the onus on cigarette uh, smokers? We that's, don't want them to smoke anyway. That's been out there. I mean, when it, this is discussed in the last several years of CAC meetings, that's one of the, the key components that, look, this is, uh, as we have this tax and as it goes up, that is a deterrent to smoking. And the numbers bear that out, at least in, as far as revenue, because the revenue has steadily gone down from the uh, cigarette tax since 2007. It's about half of what it was when it first started, 11 million. So let me ask you this, what are the stakes in this? What happens if this levy fails and what happens to that, uh, that not helping the local arts community? How are they gonna feel this punch if it doesn't go through? Well, certainly that 11 million, even though it's less, is not going to be there. It's going to just, well, it would vanish because the tax would, uh, expire in 2027 if it's not renewed. I mean, certainly there's time to, to put up another renewal uh, ask if, if, if needed. And uh, they, the, the proponents of issue 55 are calling it, I believe, an expansion. I keep saying renewal, but it's, it's six of one. So uh, if it expires in 2027, yeah, that 30 cents per pack even goes away. All right, Connor, we're going to go back to you and talk about a couple other school issues. We only have uh, uh, several minutes, but some districts like Richmond Heights and Mansfield are trying income taxes rather than property taxes. Tell us why. Yeah, they're just saying that residents are kind of tired of paying more property taxes with the recent property reappraisals that went through. There's one that's going to take effect next year in Cuyahoga County. Others, you know, have already had that happen. They just say that the, the property owners are just kind of feel like they're maxed out. So they're going to try for these income taxes. In Richmond Heights in particular, they changed to an income tax ask after their levy ask failed in the spring. Hmm. And and how is that bearing out? I mean, are there other jurisdictions where that's working out? And It's kind of yet to be seen. Uh, there's a couple that did, have seen some income taxes approved, but it, it is a little bit of a rarity. Usually income taxes are for other things or cities are passing them. So it's kind of an interesting uh, change in, in strategy. Also, many districts are seeking money to build new schools. What's driving those requests? Yeah, it's kind of a function of the way that Ohio's school funding model works. Um, you know, it's hard because districts have to choose between, okay, we got to ask voters for money regardless. Is it going to go to operating costs or is it going to go to a new building? Uh, the state doesn't really have a specific fund that is meant for uh, building outside of they will match funds. So, like, the idea is you get a levy passed to fund a new building, and then the state will kick in 30 to 40 percent or so. So, and then another thing to remember is that a lot of voters are just tired of seeing these levies on the ballot. Like Ohio voters technically vote more on school levies than a lot of other states in the country. It's just kind of the way that it works with our, our current system. Uh, your property taxes are locked in at the rate when they're approved. So, right. a levy that's passed in 2010, it's still drawing in money from those 2010 numbers. Okay. Well, that wraps it up uh, for us. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, there were some other topics we wanted to hit on, but uh, unfortunately, we, we'll have to have you back uh, before the November 5th election. So if you want to look at your ballot, you can do so by contacting your board of elections, your county board of elections, and looking up a sample ballot. You can find links to the election boards or on our website. We have a link to our voter guide in today's show page. I want to thank Connor Morris and Kabir Bhatia of uh, Ideas from Public Media for coming in and speaking with me. Thanks Glad for having me. Here. And sorry we didn't get to all the topics you've okay. covered. Next time. <laughs> all right, we're going to take another quick break. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. It's The Sound of Ideas from Ideas Stream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for spending this hour with us. A new book dives into the region's history long before Moses Cleveland arrived in the late 1700s. 
An alternative history of Cleveland explores what is known about the indigenous peoples who called the region home and how they interacted with the environment. Author John Vlachute connects with the past and the present, looking at how people are engaging with the land today. He sat down recently to discuss the book with Idea Streams Carrie Wise. Your alternative history of Cleveland goes much further back in time than the city's founding. What inspired you to write this book? For me, I think the the prelude to this community's founding, Cleveland, which always begins with, you know, whether it's the the settlement um, in the late 18th century or as the, the city is growing in the 19th century, it is kind of a bookend that doesn't really engage what happened prior to it. And that history is important because any community that is built is built necessarily upon an interaction with the environment. And to assume that humans just started doing it then when white settlers arrived, we know is false, that people have been living here for perhaps as long as 14,000 years that we have evidence for. And understanding some of those lessons, and particularly during that period of colonization, how those two civilizations interacted with one another is important. Well, there's definitely evidence in your book presented not just about human life, but animal life. And there are many things that may surprise Northeast Ohioans. One example that comes to mind is elephant bones found near Terminal Tower. Can you talk a little bit about that? This was elephant country for millions of years, and it has only been within the last, you know, 12,000 years or so that we have been without them. And the coevolution that happened between those large animals, and when we talk about the Pleistocene era, this time period during the last ice age, there were many what we call megafauna, that is animals over 100 kilograms in size, that roam the earth here in Northeast Ohio, and their bones are popping up in many places. And they're in our uh, museums. The Natural History Museum has some wonderful exhibits where they kind of provide you with the size and the different types of teeth between, say, mastodons that had a different diet than woolly mammoths. And for me, it is a reminder that the present is isn't the way it's always been and for me that's a hopeful message it's that you know the the past does structure the world we live in but things can change they can change for the worse and they can change for the better and what i hope that people get out of this is the sense that their neighborhoods the places where they they eat and they engage in entertainment here in Northeast Ohio, that beneath their feet, there is a, a rich history that is, in many cases, waiting to be discovered. A major theme that comes through in your book is humans' relationship with the environment, past and present. What are you hoping that readers are going to take away and consider in their own relationships with nature? I think that we um, ignore our relationship to the environment at our own peril, that it operates and is organized around a logic that is not of our own making. And we need to spend some time reconnecting with it, that there's a lot of wonderful joys that come with understanding how the environment works. Many of us have this memory in our own communities. And there is there are growing movements that are trying to reconnect with it. I think of like Jeremy Omansky, who um, is an owner operator at Larder in Hingetown, and how his own menu at that delicatessen is focused on what is in season. He is a certified forager from the state of Michigan, and he leads many interested and curious Clevelanders out into the forest every summer and autumn to reconnect with the landscape around them because it's not just about like an aesthetic, oh, I enjoy this landscape. This is a landscape where that can provide us sustenance. In my own community right now, I've got um, a lot of oak trees 
And it is clearly a massed year where the trees have produced this overabundance of acorns and they are falling everywhere. They're being smashed into the asphalt by the cars and the squirrels are just loving it, right? Understanding why some years those trees drop a lot of nuts and others almost none at all gives you a sense of connection to nature. It is an adaptive strategy. Do you have a favorite place to reconnect or roam in Northeast Ohio? A favorite place? Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> now that I think about it, I do. The Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve is probably my favorite place because here is a landscape that is 88 acres that juts out into the lake from if you've um, ever been to Gordon Park or you drive down um, Martin Luther King Drive through the cultural gardens. At the very end of it is this neck of land that juts out into the lake and it is basically a toxic waste dump. All of the dredgings from the Cuyahoga River and the harbor that were too toxic to dump into Lake Erie were put there. Um, same thing with Burke Lakefront Airport. They created what were called confined disposal facilities, and the Cleveland Lakefront Preserve was one of those called Dyke 14. And it is a place now that harbors hundreds of species of migrating birds every year. You can see deer there, coyote. There are at least two snakes there is a profusion of um, plant and animal life that is located there because it was a landscape that is a critical habitat right on the edge of the, the lake and the city. And we have not developed that. We, we can't put residential buildings there because of the, the problems in the soil. There were some calls to turn it into a golf course or a statue garden, but uh, a group of activists and a large collection of scientists and environmental activists worked to get that preserved as habitat. It is a beautiful place to spend some time, sit down, have a little walk. Was there anything else that you wanted to share about the book? This journey has been one that has done a lot of healing for me just as a historian so that you can only spend so much time telling stories that lead in devastation. Uh, as an environmental uh, historian, you know, we are surrounded by evidence that is not very hopeful. And what I found in the story of Cleveland is, is one of resilience and revival. And I hope that readers discover that as well. Well, thanks so much for taking time to chat. Thanks, Carrie. That was John Vlashuk in conversation with Ideastream's deputy editor of Arts and Culture, Carrie Wise. His new book, An Alternative History of Cleveland, is out today from Belt Publishing. In addition to writing about science and history, Vlashuk is an assistant professor at Michigan State University and resides in Cleveland's Slavic Village. And I stand corrected, it came out on Tuesday, October 15th, so it's been out for a couple of days. Now that wraps it up for us to get the last word on today's topics. You can send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter, now X Sound of Ideas. You can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore or on Instagram at Jenny Jenny Hamill Idea Stream. Tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, we're going to talk about the Guardians as the American League Championship Series returns to Cleveland. The team has been bringing crowds to the ballpark. Can they keep this run going? We hope so. Also, we wanted to let you know about the next Sound of Ideas community tour. It's taking place at Oberlin College on Monday, October 28th at 6 p.m. We're going to be talking about Ohio's Issue 1 and gerrymandering, as you heard early in the show. Karen Kassler will be one of our panelists. We're really excited about the conversation and excited to give this information to you for free. It's open to the public. So come on out to the event. You can learn more about the event and register at ideastream.org slash sound of ideas. If you missed any portion of the program, you can find us online or listen to the sound of ideas podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, you can hear a rebroadcast of this show tonight at nine on 89.7 WKSU. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for listening. I'll speak with you tomorrow.